Investigative reporter Lee Fong appeared on Capitol Hill yesterday to blast social media surveillance and censorship. You know, what's been very interesting, uh, Mr. Fong, you said at the beginning of the hearing, you uh, used the example from a committee hearing in 2012, and you implored the committee to approach this serious issue, AI and censorship, uh, in a bipartisan way. Uh, how do you think that's worked out in this hearing? Look, I, I watched part of that hearing and read the transcript, and, you know, this was on a much more minor issue. This was just the DHS contracting to monitor social media not censor, not interject, not work with the FBI to pressure social media to take down posts. This was arguably a much more benign issue. And in that hearing, you had both sides, Republicans and Democrats, raising very legitimate privacy concerns, free speech concerns. And it wasn't partisan. It was both sides working together to discuss these common principles. Yeah, what about this hearing? Has it worked out bipartisan way, as far as you're, you're concerned? Uh, not, not so much. Yeah. In new reporting, Li Fong makes the case that everyone loses in America's misinformation war and that there are, there are insidious alliances between big tech and government. He also details a new Twitter file story revealing that the Department of Homeland Security reportedly acted on an inaccurate tip to successfully pressure Twitter, now X, to censor a New York Times journalist. We are welcomed, wel welcoming you today to talk to us about all of this directly. Thank you for being with us today, Lee. Great to see you in studio. It's always a treat. Look, your testimony went through a, a remarkable number of instances in which uh, surveillance, government-backed surveillance, have come up more than I even, frankly, remember. And I remember we should start by helping people remember why this is such a big problem. What are some of the big stories that you've been covering that kind of justify the frustration that there isn't a bipartisan interest in actually nailing some of this down? Well, I've covered social media and other forms of censorship and surveillance for 15 years now, but showcasing the real the history of the Department of Homeland Security getting involved in these issues kind of began in an October 2022 story. I wrote about the history and kind of the backstory of CISA, you know, the sub-agency of DHS, started as an agency that was looking at physical uh, infrastructure, power lines, pipelines, and then got into cognitive infrastructure, kind of policing our intellectual thoughts and, and feelings. And, you know, this is the, the broader ag agency, DHS, starting as, uh, you know, a government entity to protect us from another 9-11, now getting into policing people's parody tweets and mm -hmm. Instagram posts, um, just an incredible bureaucratic creep. And from there, you know, I got, got involved with the Twitter files, finding really concrete examples of the FBI and DHS constantly pressuring social media companies on political speech. You know, in some cases, these were tweets and posts where there was inaccurate information, but in many cases, uh, it was uh, posts that are areas of legitimate debate, you know, like discussions around pandemic lockdowns, pan uh, vaccine passports. In the case that I, in the example I just revealed on my Substack this week, um, the Department of Homeland Security acted on an inaccurate tip and pressured Twitter to censor even a New York Times reporter during the 2020 election. It's incredible, and they've done that. Social media companies have done this at the behest of so many different U.S. agencies, Homeland Security, the FBI, the CDC, the White House itself. White House officials uh, now shown to have messaged with Amazon. You probably saw that story this week. A very similar um, tone to the messages from this White House official to Amazon, uh, similar to what we saw with Meta and with uh, Twitter, now X, in terms of, you know, how could you let all this misinformation be out there? How could you, with Amazon, it's literal books, right? They're a bookstore, and they're saying they don't want the, these anti-vaccine books um, to be available on the platform without at least, like, having them flagged as untrue by the CDC or something like that. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, if this was on the other side, if, you know, if there were um, liberal books or books that are associated with the left or pieces of literature, I think people would be apoplectic, um, very upset at that. It just so happens that many of these uh, types of content that have been censored recently have been kind of coded as conservative. But, you know, the general principle still applies. Do we want the government censoring journalists or books or other forms of content? And, you know, as I sp spoke in committee yesterday, I really wanted to make the case that it's not just the government. These cases with the government censoring are important because it's a whole different legal category. You know, that's the Supreme right. Court is now looking at with uh, 
uh, Missouri v. Biden. But there's, there's also private sector entities. You know, in my reporting, I look at pharmaceutical companies, other private interests that have pressured Twitter and other platforms to sh make content decisions that shape policies that affect their own companies. Um, again, a different legal category, but as citizens, as, as the American people, it doesn't matter if it's a, the government or a private entity, uh, we're still impacted by the censorship. Yeah, I'm curious, you mentioned, you know, that you raised a hypothetical, what if this were happening on the left, would there be more interest? But in your piece on your Substack, you do mention that there is this individual, uh, Brian Murphy, who was hired, who was previously responsible for illicit surveillance of left-wing protesters. We've obviously seen people like Abby Martin after the uh, Ukraine-Russia war started, having her entire um, show being stripped off of YouTube, along with another a number of other left-leaning actors uh, who were covering that war in a way that was being framed as Putin. Putin-centric or being Putin puppets by the mainstream media. Obviously, there's been a lot of censorship around coverage of Israel and Palestine and a new story about uh, CNN top-down um, edicts that dictate how the stories are covered, with, covered within news organizations, much less censorship that may or may not be happening on these websites. So I want to ask you, is there any increased interest from, let's say, left-leaning members of Congress, like Lashida Tlaib, who have been obviously very invested in the issue of Israel-Palestine? And what mechanisms exist to pressure websites, whether it's uh, YouTube, whether it's Twitter and Elon Musk, to continue to be transparent about how those kind of um, uh, deplatforming uh, censor censorship, soft censorship decisions are being made? Look, I've laid out a lot of examples of this. And the frustrating aspect of covering free speech issues is that there are a lot of fair weather supporters of free speech that only stand up for free speech when it's their own side being censored. But, you know, if you really want to support this principle, uh, support these values, you got to stand up even for your political opposition. And look, I, I've laid out lots of examples of uh, pro-Palestinian, Palestinian activists, people who are talking about Palestinian human rights now being censored over the last three months. You know, I broke the story last year about um, some pro-Israel activists creating artificial intelligence powered bots that mass report uh, pro-Palestinian accounts to get them censored or blocked. It's a big problem. Um, and, I, and I was really fortunate to be at this Republican convened hearing to discuss these issues of even Palestinian human rights, to talk about that, that example that I recently reported of Brian Murphy, a former Trump official, Trump intelligence official, who was building dossiers and spying on Antifa and left-wing groups. You know, I've been critical of Antifa in the past, but they, they deserve their own privacy rights. They, we don't want the government, a big government, big brother situation where everyone's being policed and given a social credit score based on what they're tweeting or, or, or engaging in First Amendment protected uh, forms of expression. Uh, the, the issue with Brian Murphy and others is that they're now moving into the private sector and, and lobbying and, and shaping uh, not just this administration, but maybe future uh, administrations in terms of content moderation decisions. Yeah, well, I'll be very interested to see what the Supreme Court decides on this in the case that you mentioned, um, and if they put any limits on how much the government officials specifically can talk to the, uh, the social media companies. I think a lot of us believe there's Maybe some interaction is okay. There are law enforcement issues sure. on social media, and you, you said that in your comments. It's not that there's never going to be any reason for uh, for the FBI to talk to Mark Zuckerberg, but when it's going down to like granular what you're allowed to say on the platform and what whether you're allowed to have an account on, in terms of policy questions, activism, COVID, et cetera, it's clearly gone way too and, far. And shadow banning, so people aren't even aware of the extent the to which they've policies been policies they're limited. violating, yeah. they have no idea. It makes people exactly. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, we appreciate uh, your reporting, which I guess you're still calling the Twitter files, even though now it makes sense to call it the X files. <laughs> the X but that's files. a different <laughs> thing. <laughs> Lee, thank you so much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me. Great Good stuff. to see you guys. More rising right after this.